All right, hello everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check. So if you can hear my voice, please type in a Y. Please type in a Y in the chat box as soon as my voice is coming through. As soon as we get confirm on the audio visual side, we'll get this session started. Session. <laughs> as uh, have a, have a chart on the other screen, watching price action right now. Although it's it's pretty quiet out there today. Um, all right, beautiful. It looks like we're loud and clear, good to go, and I just want to thank everybody very much for your time in advance. Uh, as I alluded to, things have felt pretty quiet over the past two days. Um, I think that this is probably a combination of factors. One, we've just had two really big weeks of data. Um, last week, of course, we had NFP, uh, BOE with a, a fresh bazooka being launched. The week before that, we had the Fed, BOJ. So it's been a pretty pensive couple of weeks, and this week, it was pretty light on the economic docket. Um, we had Chinese PMI come out last night. We have an RBNZ rate decision tomorrow, but outside of those two events, it's pretty much flat until Friday when we get European GDP and C, uh, CPI numbers. So this is an ample week to see some consolidation or maybe a little bit give back from some of those prior trends, some of those prior moves, and we're going to talk about all of that and then more. Uh, before we do that, I need to go through a couple of quick risk disclaimers. I'm going to leave each up for about 15 seconds, and uh, then we'll get directly onto the chart. As always, any questions that you have, feel free to type those in the chat box beforehand, and when we get, when we get to the Q&A portion of the webinar, I'll be more than happy to cover those for you and answer as many as I possibly can while we're here on the, the live feed. But let's go ahead and get to those risk disclaimers, and then we'll bring up the chart and get this session on its way. Risk disclaimer part one, trading is risky. I'm going to leave this up for about 15 seconds. I want to make sure everybody's nice and comfortable and familiar with this. Then we'll move on to disclaimer part two. I'll give that one about 15 seconds as well. All right, now time for disclaimer part two, the hypothetical trading disclaimer. We're going to look at some strategy. We're going to look at some past trades. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Same thing, if you're not familiar with this, take a few moments to familiarize yourself with it. And we'll bring on the chart here in a moment. Question from Yaz, a uh, new software. How come this is not on Daily Effects Plus? We still do have quite a few webinars on Daily Effects Plus. Uh, that's going to be exclusive for FXCM clients only because it needs the FXCM account to, to access that. Um, for my webinars, we wanted to broaden those out a little bit more, make them available to pretty much anybody that might be interested. So uh, that's the explanation for why we're using GoTo as opposed to uh, Daily Effects Plus. Daily Effects Plus just for live FXCM clients. We still have a lot of great content in there um, day in and day out. My webinars, a little bit different. We do those here over GoTo webinar, um, especially of recent. I mean, the GoTo webinar software has just become fantastic. So it generally allows for some better overall experience. Um, but let's get right to those charts. Now, the core of what I'm looking at right now is right here in the U.S. dollar. And I know this is center of the discussion uh, tail into last week on Thursday when we last spoke. And Friday brought us NFP. That was a blowout NFP print. We were going in with an expectation of 175 to 180, depending on who you were listening to. The actual print came out at 255. It was a blowout NFP. And this was the second consecutive blowout NFP print that we've received. A month prior, of course, we were looking for 180, got a print of 287. And even that was revised higher to 292 this most recent Friday. So I'm going to drop this in the chat box so anybody interested wants a little rebreather on uh, what happened on Friday. There you go. I could certainly help. And you could probably see from the title of that article, the big question that I have had and still have, was whether the dollar strength that came from the NFP report is a lasting move or not. Now, there's a couple of interesting ways of looking at this. One, and this is the one, this is the most common rebuttal that I hear. The Fed's not hiking anytime soon. Okay, well, I mean, maybe not, but that's not the only thing that could drive currency flows into the U.S. dollar. Maybe perhaps other economies are just that much more dovish than the Fed. And so, like, let's take a look at the pound dollar as an example, right? If the BOE is getting way more dovish and, and, and the Fed's staying right about where they were, well, then that's still a change in the interest rate expectation in this currency pair. We're expecting weak rates out of the UK, flat here on the US dollar. It's going to equate to the sterling going down. 
right? So even if I am looking for USD strength, it doesn't necessarily denote that I'm looking for an interest rate hike anytime soon. This could come from a few other facets, a few other, I guess, themes could drive flows in here. But there's the move that we had seen on Friday, and notice that that move was, was sold. Actually, it popped higher. Let's look at this on an hourly chart so we can get that near-term price action, the way this thing had moved. See, you can even see very visually here, most of that strength in the U.S. dollar took place in about two hours. Print came out at 8.30 right here. We had some follow-through continuation right here at that 9 o'clock bar. And then after, it was give back. And notice right now, right now the dollar is sinking back towards that swing support level right here at about 11.963. That's near-term or very short-term support that we have uh, right now on USD. But why is it that this might not be a lasting move? That's a good question. I mean, this is something that we're going to have to wait for the Fed. The Fed's uh, September 20th, 21st. Just before that, we hear from the BOJ. But what's appeared to happen here, and I think we could even dial this back to FOMC in the week prior, what's begun to happen here is that even when we do get these hawkish signs that should equate to dollar strength on the back of, of stronger U.S. rate expectations, as we get that those clues, markets are kind of saying, I don't think so. And they faded out real quickly. So last week, sir, uh, two weeks ago, FOMC came out with a slightly more hawkish statement. And if we don't want to call it hawkish, we could simply say less dovish. And the U.S. dollar sold off after rallying initial, initially on that statement. So we had that initial rally, notice this wick right here, and then traders sold that and brought it right back down to support. We hung on on Thursday, and then US GDP, the Friday before last, so one week before last week's NFP print, came out abysmally bad, and that's what gave us this huge support break in here. Notice how we violated the entirety of that prior support structure that it built in. Nice little price action support that it built in for like a few weeks leading into that dollar move, and then once that U.S. GDP report came out, that had pretty much exhausted those rate high hopes for September, at least at the time. U.S. GDP came in at 1.2% versus an expectation of 2.5, and at that point, while things were still kind of hanging on and the expectation that we might get a more hawkish Fed in the coming months, well, that, at least at the time, had obliterated that. Brought us right back down to support. Now, this continuation move happened on the release of the Japanese government budget which indicated far less fiscal stimulus than many had hoped. That gave us another major move lower here on the U.S. dollar. And then the rest of the week was spent clawing that back. There's that NFP print right there. And notice, since that NFP print, price action is, is ranging around up here, right? You can almost see where markets are kind of trying to figure out that next direction here on the dollar. Let's go down to the hourly, get a better depiction of that range. There we go. Like right in here. So this thing could really make or break from, from where we're at now, right? And and even without, you know, the, the, the prospect of an actual rate hike coming out of the Fed anytime soon, okay? When we're trading currencies and when we're trading currency flows, we're not necessarily trading directly on rate hikes, rate cuts. It's on the market's expectation for the future of rate hikes and rate cuts, okay? That's why we have a situation like we have now where much of the market isn't expecting a rate hike out of the Fed until well into 2017. And if we get a positive piece of data like an NFP report, that jostles the do dollar higher, right? Even if we're not going to get a rate hike anytime soon. So what I wanted to do today is I wanted to look at areas where we might be able to position for the multitude of scenarios that might come about from here. Um, in essence, the Fed's in a between a rock and a hard place, but but they're not in as rough of a position as a bank, say, like the Bank of Japan or the PBOC. Uh, we discussed the PBOC's problems earlier this morning in Market Talk, and it was or is our one-year anniversary of uh, writing Market Talk. So if you want to get on that, uh, this is my distribution list. I sent an email no more than once a day um, with my morning commentary. But you have all these central banks out there that want the same type of thing, right? Like, for instance, if we go to Europe, I mean, they're in the middle of a gigantic bond-buying program. 
and there's the threat, there's the, the fear that they may be going for more in the coming months, right? Because the one thing that we know is that European economy is still in pretty bad shape, even with all the stimulus that they've done. It's probably unlikely that the ECB is going to say, you know what? Forget this stimulus thing. Let's just see how the economy does without our help. That's no, probably not going to happen, right? So expectation is for more stimulus to be coming out of Europe at some point in the future. The UK, I mean, they just launched a, a artillery of stimulus, and there's still expectations for even more. If we want to go east, let me look at Japan. Well, up until two weeks ago, hopes were running high for another round or extension of Japanese intervention. We ended up getting a very underwhelming BOJ response. They doubled ETF purchases, which in a normal environment would be a huge amount of stimulus. But here, markets were looking for far more. Well, largely underwhelmed, that Japanese government budget shot it right back down. Oh no, I take that back. That's BOJ. That's Japanese government budget deficit, or uh, Japanese government budget. Notice it has brought us down to what is looking like a longer term higher low. So there's still the expectation for the BOJ to do even more. Of course, China, that yuan has been incredibly weak. I mean, this is going back to February of 2014. Notice that yuan weakness. You know, and as an aside, think about what this means for Japan. Japan's China's number two trade partner after the United States. Think about what this means for Japan. As the yuan weakens, where's that capital going? Sure, some's going into the U.S. dollar. But if we look at the U.S. dollar's performance against the Japanese yen since, say, mid-March, well, the yen's actually strengthened more. Right? Go back to mid-March. Notice how much strength has come into the yen as the yuan has weakened. So, both of those very major central banks in Asia are kind of on the same on the same trend or theme of looking for currency weakness. So, when we're in an environment where most of these major economies are actively looking to weaken their own currencies, well, what can the Federal Reserve do? This is kind of a situation that we had at the beginning of the year when the Fed was looking at a full four rate hikes in 2016, while most global central banks are actively looking at looser policy. What this does is this exposes the U.S. dollar to rampant currency flows. And, and many might think, oh, well, that's not a big deal. That's good. Dollar's stronger. That's stability for the world. But think about the trade relationships. All right. If the U.S. is the lone economy that's not currently facing deflationary pressure, as we've seen in the U.K. on the back of Brexit, or supposedly on the back of Brexit, as we're seeing out of Europe, Japan, China, if the U.S. is the lone economy that is healthy, if left unchecked, all of that capital flow coming out of those other economies, coming into the U.S. dollar, will eventually pull the U.S. into recession. It's not a, it's not a question of if. It's a matter of when. And Ms. Yellen had spoken of this at the early portion of the year when the Fed was dead set on quote-unquote normalizing rate policy while much of the rest of the world was looking to actively weaken their own currencies. So this alludes to the fact that the Fed may be overly dovish in the coming months in the attempt of preventing a rampantly strong U.S. dollar as the U.S. is one of the few economies right now that's not showing deflationary signs of weakness. This is a result of a globalized economy. The U.S. doesn't exist in a vacuum, and I don't think many people that govern U.S. markets are under that mistaken belief. It's a globalized theme. If China, Japan, Europe, and the U.K., if they're all deflating, and if there's weakness in all of those currencies, that money has to flow somewhere, and it can't all go into gold. So this is one reason why I'm keeping a rather moderate long-term stance on U.S. dollar strength. Because even though the U.S. is one of the lone economies showing some signs of growth, they can't grow alone. And if anything, the Fed sees this. And as we go into a meeting like September, there's even more reasons for the Fed to not be hawkish here for fear of firing off trouble around the world. Kind of similar to what we saw at the March Fed statement when they reinserted that phrase, cognizant of global pressure. 
global risks, if you will. So to me, longer term, this still looks like a fade. Let's look at a few areas where we might be able to trade with such a move. So there's a pretty interesting price action event happening here in the euro dollar. Now, this is a messy, messy chart over the longer term, um, or rather over the near term. Longer term is a little more clean. Uh, nice downtrend, forming into a, a beautiful bear flag formation. Gave us two underside resistance checks. Since then, price action, it looks like it's been trying to dig on lower lows and lower highs. There's the lower low, there's the lower high. Got this lower low right in here on the Brexit referendum, but since then it's kind of been chop city, right? So this is something I want to be careful of if, if, if looking for a big move. This would be more like a near-term type of swing type of mentality, looking to take price back down towards prior support, like right there, 109.50. Seems like it could be a pretty comfortable area for such a thing. Uh, now we go down to the four hour chart. There we go. You can kind of see what I'm looking at. Um, so this was the level that I was looking at for support going into NFP last week. Of course, that support did not hold. NFP just blew right through that. But now look at what's happening. Now that old support is coming in as potential new resistance. Just a little bit above that. I have another swing high to work with that also lines up with prior support. So again, short-term setup, but this would be something that I'd look to get the stop above this point of resistance at 1160. So we end up taking on about 65 pips of risk. And that'll allow me to get my stop above the prior swing high. On the profit target side, I'd want to clear this thing off. I'd want to clear off some risk at about 65 up, so that gives me about 110.35. Just a little bit inside of this low right here. That gets me a 1 1. But again, I want to play it down here to this deeper support range around 109 and a half. And I can get that risk reward a little bit more attractive for me. Now, this would be a play on near term dollar strength. Okay, Even though longer term, my bias is one of bearishness, or uh, I guess we could say a slight tinge of bearishness, um, this would be playing on the prospect of continuation of this USD trend. Uh, under the thesis this this may be higher low support to work with coming in in the zone of old resistance. So that's the first idea I wanted to look at for today. Quick swing position here in the euro dollar. Playing off a couple of different interesting zones of resistance. Plan for that range to fill in. Now if we get back down to support in the range I don't know if I'd want to hold anything here. I'd likely want to close off the entirety of the position and then if we get a bottom side break below this 109 figure then that's when I might be able to uh, you know look at re-entry something like that but I probably want to take all of this out once hitting support. Um, Sterling I'm still in a uh, I mean uh, non-committal mode here. The problem that I have with the British pound right now is one of possible upside. Right, we have a really strong trend to the downside. Something like that, you know, usually pretty attractive. Look at this on the weekly chart. Look at all of these wicks traversing through this 32 and a quarter, 32 and a third area. Right, some good price action to work with on resistance. Multiple tests up there. Right now, we go down. Kind of see the bane of the issue. All right, so there's our Brexit low. This is what I'm calling the post-Brexit low, because if you remember right after Brexit, Mark Carney had come out and said, hey guys, Brexit's a bad thing, I'm going to cut rates, and it's like, man, it was just a week ago, it's not showing in the data yet, right? But nonetheless, investors didn't want, didn't want to get caught flat-footed, so they sold out of the sterling ahead of that rate decision, moved it all the way down here, created that peak low. And right down here, we have another little grouping of these, these uh, this, this swing support around 2050. So like 2788, 2850, all possible support levels. Uh, 130, of course, we just crossed through that, and now we're kind of working around it. Uh, 3015, I have a level at as well. It's uh, 76.4, fib retracement of a long-term move. Go down to the hourly. Uh, let's go back on the four-hour. There we go. And so to me, after the move hit post-NFP, I just didn't have enough juice in the squeeze to want to reload this to the short side. Um, now, that being said, I don't necessarily want to take a long either. Um, I think what could make this attractive, the scenario that could make this maybe a, a tinge more attractive, is if we do get some near-term softness in the U.S. dollar. 
as in like if this support doesn't hold, if this breaks down and maybe test this prior resistance level, a little bit deeper in here, those levels about 11,950. If we do get that breakdown in the dollar, then that could be something that could be opportunistic for a trend like we have in the cable, all right? Because it, it, it appears the sentiment here is fairly clear, it's bearish. And we know why, because the BOE is extremely dovish. The problem that we have is that this thing is stretched. There's not a lot of room to plot profit targets on the underside of price action. And then further to that point, we don't really have any nearby swing highs to work with, save for this swing high right here at about 3175. That's going to end up costing me a couple hundred pips of risk. So even if I take that with the current setup, I basically need a new low to come in just to get a 1-1 risk reward ratio or thereabout. And we might not even get that new low. Maybe it comes down and creates a higher low, just five, ten pips above that prior low. And then I'm I'm out of luck. Right? I still have my position, limits not cleared. Then I could just run back, hit my stop. So the risk reward here is utterly unattractive to me on a continuation play to the downside. Um, what I do like is if this thing can move back a little bit, i.e. again, if we get that US dollar softness in the next couple of days, if it could bring it back to one of these prior swing levels, then that might be a little bit more usable. Like notice right in here, let me get rid of these boxes. Notice like right in here, we have these two wicks touching just right about 131. Comes in just a couple, just a little bit below that prior little support hit right there. Let's take this down on hourly, get a little more clean. There we go. All right, so that gives me a possible resistance zone to work with if price gets back up there. Like right in there, right around 131. Now, if we blow past 131, I could do the same type of thing at about 131.50, right? Prior, uh, prior swing high. It meshes up very nicely with this prior series of lows. Let's just put that one smack at about 131.75. There we go. I've got a little zone there, too. So if we could get some U.S. dollar weakness in the next couple of days, this is something that could end up being or becoming attractive. Uh, until then, I just not super excited on the prospect to continue downside, or at the very least, looking for breaks of support uh, to look for fresh lows. Not a low data week. All right, um, let's move on. Swissy. So this is one that I'm a little bit more excited about, looking for dollar strength than against the euro, and. The reason for that one is, is, and I hate even saying this, but the positioning of the Swiss National Bank in comparison to the ECB, right? The Swiss National Bank, they've already intervened in spot markets in the post-Brexit environment. Like right after Brexit, let me get this back down to the daily, right after Brexit, right here. Notice that US dollar just ripped against the Swiss franc, right? Well, the Swiss National Bank intervened here. They were worried about rampant franc strength right here against the euro. And that had put in a huge move in a flight to quality run on the heels of that Brexit referendum. So the Swiss National Bank actually intervened here to weaken the Swiss and to stem that rampant strength that they were seeing in the franc. Now, I'm not even necessarily expecting the Swiss National Bank is going to intervene anytime soon. Again, this is simply trying to play on the expectations of the expectations of others, right? Which is, if I'm looking for a dollar strength longer term play, given that we have an economy in Europe that's likely going to continue to face pressure, surrounding an economy in Switzerland that likely is going to try to keep that Euro Swiss spot rate relatively tight, this could be something that has some additional room to run. Now, Current price action setup. Hopefully, you see this little channel. Let me clear this up a little bit. Right in there. All right, so we have this channel on the Swiss franc, and I'm just simply finding this by connecting the May low to the August 24th low. That was China's Black Monday. Notice we get that third point for confirmation right here in the middle of it. Since then, we've seen quite a few price action inflections, especially intraday, around this level, around this trend line. 
if we go down, that's what's happening right now. We've had two consecutive days of resistance. And notice right now we have a doji after an up day. This could be like parts one and two of an evening star formation, a bearish reversal pattern. Right, so near term, this is a short for me. But what I want is I want to see it come a little bit closer to the zone around 97.50 down to 97 flat. And the reason that I want that is because I want to be able to buy the long, uh, uh, buy USD against a currency that I expect could have some additional tinge of weakness in the future. So in order to get it, to buy it at a higher low. Because if we get support coming in around 97 to 97.50, North of this prior low at about 96 and a third, that gives me a higher low to work with. Stop go, stop go below the prior low, and then I can look for that continuation move. But the goal of getting a 1 1 risk reward ratio at this 98.47 level. Another reason that I may be a little more excited about, the, about looking for dollar strength against the franc than the euro is this one's been a little cleaner when we've been in this, this kind of this, this choppy area. Um, you know, and I think that, and again, this is just my opinion, but it's resultant of the Swiss franc being the far less actively traded market than what we'll often see in the euro. But you can see some of the support and resistance inflections that we've had on the Swiss franc have just been fantastic. Like 99.48, for instance. Go out to the weekly chart. I'll, I'll even show you where I got these fibs from. Um, so 99.48 is 38.2% of the 2010 to 2011 move, high to low. 61.8% of that move are traced, or 38.2% of the total moves at 99.48. And this has been a hugely important level. Quite a bit of resistance showing here. Uh, 94.41, another interesting level. And for that one, I'm simply taking the 2005 high down to that same 2011 low. 61.8% of that move, or 38.2% retracement of that move, comes in right at 94.41. Check this out. I'll go down to the daily chart. That was a swing low in May. And then we have that trend line. It's continued to show some promise here. It's another reason I wouldn't want to buy it just yet. Let that resistance hold. Wait for price action to wiggle down. 97.50, psychological level, 97 flat, the FIB level. Decent little zone for support to come in and reloading that top side move. Looking for a continuation higher. Uh, now if we get back to 99.48, again, kind of like I was showing you on that Euro setup at uh, 109 and a half, I probably want to cinch off the remainder of my risk. Not get too greedy when we're nearing, inching up towards that parity level. And if anything, I would look to get a higher low and reload that past parity if I was going to look to uh, to trade that beyond 99.5 with current structure. Oh man, time's just flying. I got a bunch of dollar setups here. See, when things get quiet, that's when I think that's when I think traders want to uh, uh, you know that's when I work the hardest. When things are moving pretty quick, I mean, I've done all the leg work, the plans already set. At that point, I just got to enter orders based on how I decided to do it already. When things get quiet, that's when it's time to come up with new ideas. Uh, dollar CAD, pretty interesting one here. So a huge, bout of CAD, uh, a huge bout of CAD weakness running all the way in to January. And then, uh, you know, a monster turnaround, right? Quick reversal. And this thing has lasted, it had lasted for like four months. This is a big change of pace to cross-border trade flows for anybody that lives or works around that Canadian border. I mean, we're talking a differentiation of like 20 cents in the spot rate in a few months, you know. So if, if you're a producer in Canada selling products in the U.S. and your Canadian dollar is strengthening against the U.S. dollar, well, fantastic. If it's doing this, well, if you're importing goods, you're not going to be doing too well, right? Because now you're seeing inflation on imported goods and your domestic Canadian dollars are worth less. If, you're an, if you're, you're, you're an exporter and you're exporting goods out of Canada into the international marketplace, something like this, not bad. Something like this could end up becoming really bad. Canadian dollar strength. It's a big shift in monetary policy here. Now since that low was set, on May 3rd. Now, do you guys remember what happened on May 3rd? 
was a surprise RBA interest rate cut. Nobody was expecting that one. They took everybody by surprise. And this kicked off a lot of trends in USD. We actually just saw that low on 99, at uh, 94.41 on the Swissy. Well, this put in a big change of pace, too, on, on the CAD. Right? Notice we set that very significant swing low and began this topside pattern, ran right into 130. This topside pattern that continues today, building in a relatively clean channel here. Now, going into the NFP, price action was literally setting like 130 the day before. NFP gave us a strong burst, and now you can see where price action is attempting to carve in a higher low here on a short-term basis. Let's go down to like a four hours so we can see that. There we go. So you can see that burst around NFP, a little bit of continuation. Since then, this thing has settled, and now it's attempting to carve out support around old resistance. We also have this projected trend line in here as part of that longer-term bullish channel. All right, so this could be a topside USD play if uh, one of you treats this aggressively. The, the difficulty is going to be in stop placement here because we are quite a bit divorced off that prior swing low at like 130, right? Meaning it would necessitate about 140 pips of risk with current prices to be able to get in and get my stop below that swing. That's not too attractive. So I have a couple of other options here, neither of which are, are, are really fantastic. The first of which, if I'm going to go for 140 pip stop, I could widen out my profit targets and look for a bigger macro play. And if I feel okay with that, that could be a thesis that could really work. But if I'm going to take 140 a risk, I want to see about 250 to 280 of possible upside to make this worth my while. That would put me at about 34.15 with current market prices. So I would not only need a breakout here in dollar cad, I would need a big breakout in dollar cad to be able to clear that risk with a 1.2. Not a big fan of those prospects. Alternatively, what I could do is I could take just a significantly tighter risk profile. Meaning, if I do want to base this as that higher swing low, I can even give this a little bit of room underneath. I could call that stop like 3085, just to nest it, get it right here next to those prior points of resistance. And now I'm taking on about 50 pips of risk, which granted, 50 pips is nothing to sneeze at, but 3240 gives me a 1 2. Which is not as unattainable <laughs> as getting a print all the way up to 3415. Or I can maybe even take it on a little bit tighter, you know, say like a 32 and a quarter, in which case I have. Just about 90 pips upside risk. That gives me about 45 pips of room to work with on the stop. 45 pips below current market price gives me about 30, 90. Call it 30, 95. There we go. And so now I could trade something quite a bit shorter term, uh, a little bit quicker. And it's by dialing on the chart and taking a, t a tighter stop with a smaller overall profit target. All right, one more setup, and then I'll start getting to your questions. Like I said, any markets you want me to take a look at, don't hesitate to type them in. I'll do my best to uh, answer them right here while we're on the webinar. All right, so another market that's been on the move of recent with all this macro discussion, the gold, gold market. Um, this thing has been running uh, extremely volatile throughout 2016 on, on the back of the Fed backing up. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's hard for many to believe that this was the gold chart coming in to 2016. That's two years of pain. We even go back before that, that's three years of pain. It's like five years of pain, right? And then, and, and as you know, a surprise would have it, 26% rip in gold year to date. Pretty big reversal, right? Now the tough part about gold, and you can even see it on this chart is that most of the trend side move happens in a very quick and very violent manner. It's kind of like the opposite of stocks, right? Stocks will usually slowly and gradually edge up and then they'll slam down, right? The old saying is, you know, something along the lines of, you know, it takes one day to erase three months worth of gains. Well, it's got similar drivers behind this, right? What is one of the things that's been most positive for gold? It's been fear, risk aversion, right? That's really what we've seen picking up this year, fear and risk aversion. 
And so these topside pops have been quick and violent in a similar manner to the way that equity sell-offs are usually quick and violent. But the majority of the time, gold has actually been grinding backwards this year, right? Like that move to consolidate this one, this move to consolidate this one, this move to consolidate these two prior, this move to consolidate that one, you kind of get what I'm talking about. So with gold, I think the most important thing is being long at the right time. I know that's a Captain Obvious statement. But when the expectation is for global monetization to be like one of the few tools that central banks have to try to continue countering all of these pressures, then, then logically speaking, we're going to see investors factoring in more and more and more monetization from these central banks until one of two things happens. Either A, the global economy gets quote-unquote fixed and starts growing again, or B, one of these central banks breaks. Now, historically speaking, there's only been one of those patterns that has ever really been prominent. And it results in hyperinflation, right? Because if you have something like Japan on the verge of printing helicopter money, well, that could dramatically weaken the yen, maybe even to the point where the Bank of Japan loses control of that weakness. And then what happens if the yen weakens and the Bank of Japan loses control? Well, now you have rampant inflationary pressure. That's going to be a lot more difficult to contain than slow growth, low inflation, right? The problems the central banks are dealing with right now aren't as bad as they could be if we're discussing something like the Weimar Republic. Now, I know these are extreme examples, but historically speaking, monetization of currency, the deeper monetization of currency, has not necessarily been a good thing unless it's gold. <laughs> because the quote that we're looking at is basically the price of one ounce of gold in terms of US dollars. So if that dollar weakens, then gold's going higher. And that's been one of the biggest topside drivers here to gold prices. As the Fed's backed off of that four rate hikes idea, gold popped higher, consolidated those gains. Then we get to like the March FOMC statement, uh, where, 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 where the, the Fed backs off of two, uh, four rate hikes and moves it to two. Then we get another topside pop in gold. Then it shimmies lower until we get another big event that pops in more strength. Now, again, remember May 3rd? Remember May 3rd? That's when the RBA came out with a surprise interest rate cut. Remember what else happened around there? Janet Yellen and the Fed started talking up the prospect of a hike in June. That's when we saw that U.S. dollar strength coming back. That's when we saw gold prices getting hit. Gold prices shed off about $100. Peaked to trough in the month of May. Notice we had just ticked up here with a high of 1303 And then by the end of May, we had a low that had broken below 1200 Over $100 off in one month. But what ended up happening is that June NFP report the, the report before the two that I mentioned earlier, that was abysmally bad, much like the GDP report that we had just seen. And so as that abysmal G, uh, NFP report for the month of May gets permeated into markets in June, investors say, yeah, the Fed, they're not hiking anytime soon. Dollar weakness, gold to new highs. Then we have the Brexit referendum, new highs. And then we have like the, the global central bank shuffle of dovishness in response to the Brexit referendum, gold new highs. And so now you can see where these pullbacks are getting less dramatic, right? There's the support level that we had going into the most recent Fed meeting. Gold didn't quite make a new high, right? I guess the Fed didn't go dovish enough here. <laughs> But as this moves lower, you're getting more and more and more folks that are on the sidelines saying, well, yeah, the Fed, they might talk tough right now, but let's face it. The rest of the world looking to actively weaken their own currencies, the Fed's not going to hike rates anytime soon. And so this is why this thing has been getting more and more and more bullish. That's why these topside spikes have been getting more and more and more aggressive. If you look back right here, when this bullish move just started to get underway, sure, these are big moves, but nothing like what we had on February 11th when Janet Yellen was speaking in front of Congress and backed down on the whole full rate hike thing. And nowhere near like what we had in the Brexit referendum, when a bunch of unknowns started to just fly all over the place. So 
there's really, again, if we dial this back to the logical decision set of these central banks, there's really only a couple of ways for them to go. Either you keep doing what you've been doing and trying to stimulate the economy with monetary policy that probably isn't working, or you give up, you quit, and you let a collapse take place. I don't expect any central banks to do that anytime soon. So even if these tools aren't working that well, I do expect them to continue fully firing them as they need to. And even though U.S. data might be slightly decent right now, as evidenced by a couple of decent NFP reports, the fact that the rest of the world is still flagging lower, well, that precludes the option of the U.S. seeing gangbusters growth in the years ahead. Again, that's my opinion. But that's why price action is here. I don't have to trade directly on my opinion. Let the setup show. Trade the setup. That, my friends, is what I have for today. I want to see what kind of questions you all have. Please don't hesitate to ask me anything trading related. I'll do the best I can. Um, this is also from Yas, who was asking about uh, webinar mediums. Does Michael Boutros also do uh, do his daily effects webinars here? Uh, yes, uh, Boutros does his webinars and go to as well. And uh, anybody that does want to follow the webinar calendar, whether it's on go to the live classroom, daily effects plus, uh, whatever, we have this right here, the webinar calendar. Click on that. That'll bring you. Well, it's gonna create some inception mode like thing where it puts me in my own webinar. It's gonna be weird. Um, but if you just go down to the webinar calendar, you click on the respective event, it will pop up either the sign up for that webinar or it'll take you directly into the room. Like that's Daily Effects Plus. Uh, but right here, bookmark this, great location. Whenever you have market questions, click on that, go into the next webinar, and we're happy to help as much as we can. Uh, from Tim Kirby, can we trade US dollar and US oil? So those markets are not available to US residents, unfortunately. Um, so FXCM cannot offer exposure to US residents in those markets because the charts that I was looking at are what are called CFDs or contracts for difference and it's not the actual on exchange traded product here in the United States so unfortunately if uh, if you're a US resident FXCM can't offer those assets to you those markets to you um, from Sue I don't understand why the juror is uh, in an uptrend yet it had made lower highs and lower lows from April 2015 oh it's uh, and I believe Sue's referring to the DAX the German 30 um, so it's all a matter of perspective right Sue so like if I look at it here just on a daily chart yeah that's a clean channel and it just broke out of the top side of that channel but go back to a weekly chart and that's a bull flag right yeah, I know it looks intimidating on the daily, but, you know, with perspective, it's just, you know, with perspective, this could just be a near-term impediment, right? Just a dip in the top portion of that uptrend. So, you know, right now I'm looking at roughly the 26-year, 25-year chart on, on the DAX. And what's really interesting to me is the way that the German expansionary move has, has kind of helped define everything else. So right in here, I'm taking the low in the year 1990, drawing that up to the high in the year 2000. And that's what I'm calling the German expansionary move. The 27.2% extension of that move comes in right at 99.89, spot 95. What's really cool though is the 618 extension of that move comes in right at 12.348, spot 29. Want to guess where that top came in at? Just a couple of handles above that, 12,398. So, you know, to me, in my eyes, it looks like this these uh, FIB extensions caught this move pretty well. Go down a little bit tighter, though, weekly. Now it's going to start looking a little bit more bearish, right? Because each of these individual candles is going to stand out quite a bit more. But, I mean, even if scrolling out, taking in the trend that we had from 2011 all the way up to 2015, it still looks like a bull flag, right? Retracement in the uptrend. It's once we get into this daily, this four hour, when this starts to seem really threatening, right? Like here, now, yeah, that looks pretty abysmal. It looks pretty negative. But it's really just a matter of perspective. Um, now, what I do to try to counter that, that, that quandary perspective is what's called multiple time frame analysis. I'll use the same few charts 
on, on most of the setups that I'm trading so that I have a bit of formality from market to market. So it's kind of like looking at apples to apples versus apples to oranges. So like, let's say Euro, for instance, when we started off, the first thing that I wanted to look at, that daily chart, right? I wanted to see that quick little resistance inflection. But then we dialed back to the weekly to kind of get an idea for just overall trend flow, the choppiness that's emanated of recent. But it, it's uh, like for me, trading perspective, the daily, the four hour, and the one hour are all pretty key. Once I look at those three, once I have a good idea of what's going on on those three, then that's when I could go into a really short term chart and start scalping some entries, looking to do things a little bit quicker. And, and the whole reason that I look to do that is so that I could get tighter risk levels, a little bit more granularity, and a few additional price action swings that are going to be afforded from the much faster, quicker, albeit less consistent time frame. Less consistent because there's just a lot less data going into each and every one of those bars. But uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, Amy Gill, Aussie, please. Yeah, this thing is just bubbling higher. Um, and I expected this to pull lower if we got a strong dollar on NFP. And, you know, initially it looked like that was going to work, but it just didn't. Ended up with a pretty strong reversal around that event. But there we go. Another trend line just broke out of the top of. I don't have a lot of good good analysis on this one. I mean, on a macro basis, I like it short. Um, same thing on a Kiwi. I've been trying to catch a short off some of these resistance points. It just hasn't worked at all. Um, so the, the Aussie's been a lot stronger than, I, than I've been looking for. Bullish continuation? I don't know. I might be able to might be able to work with something there. This 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 you know kind of has um, what I was referring to a little bit earlier, where it, you know it just grinds to the top side, but then the short side is you know fast and aggressive. Grinds to the upside and short and aggressive uh, downside. I don't know, maybe 76. As in, if we could get a you know quick support wick coming out about 75 and a quarter, I might be able to get a stop in like 75.90. That might be something that's workable. Other than that, I just don't have a lot going on right here right now. You know, you see all these wicks on both sides of those candles, and that shows that there's. You know, there's been some efforts to catch a reversal there, but we just popped to a new high. So I wouldn't want to directly fade that just on its face. Uh, from Marco Garces, I don't remember. I'm sorry, I was going pretty fast. I don't remember what I was speaking of at the exact time, but he asks, uh, will that really justify such pessimistic versions of the global economy, or is it just a strategy to gain competitiveness? Well, so it's it's pretty interesting, right? I mean, if you look at where we're at technology-wise, uh, uh, you know, uh, scientifically speaking, in a lot of ways, we have an optimized world, right? I mean, if you go back 50 years ago and say, hey, the regular common person will have a device in their pocket that will give them the entirety of knowledge that's ever been discovered in this world and they can access anything within a couple of minutes. If you'd go back and say that that was possible, very few would probably ever believe you, you know? Um, but when it comes to science, when it comes to technology, we're dealing with uh, laws, rules, right? Things that don't break. In economics, Economics is still very much a pseudoscience. We don't really understand a lot of what's going on. All that we know at this point is ways that will bring on certain death, right? Like the gold standard, for instance. That's why you don't hear this coming up as an idea, because it was served to be such a bad idea after the world repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly tried it. We know that won't work, but we don't know what will work. And that's kind of the problem facing these central banks right now. They don't know what will work. Now, there's some theories out there. There's some ideas but nothing that's been time tested. So the reason for a lot of the pessimism is the fact that we've just had optimism on top of optimism, on top of optimism, on top of optimism, on top of optimism. And what I mean by that is debt, right? What is debt? Debt is an optimistic bet that you're going to get paid back, right? And now once governments attain the ability to take out debt, 
That gave governments the ability to put band-aids over their problems with more debt. Now, initially, that doesn't necessarily present much of an issue. That gives governments fresh capital to do what they need, build infrastructure, whatever. But over the long term, that debt adds up until eventually all of your money, all of your income is going to service that debt. Now, eventually you get to a tipping point when your income goes down and now you can't service your debt any longer with your currently available income and you have no money to use to actually invest, build things. That's kind of the problem the world has right now. Most of these major economies are so incredibly indebted that they don't have a lot of latitude to take out more debt to fix those prior problems. And so, you know, regarding the, the pessimism, I think there's a couple of things to be said on that. One is market prognosticators are generally going to be cynical as a bunch, right? Um, as the old saying goes, markets don't award the masses. It's supply and demand, right? But two, I think we live in a crisis culture. You know, I started trading in 1999, had the tech bus shortly thereafter, and then we rode that up to the housing boom, housing bus shortly thereafter. You know, most of my trading career has been in a crisis-like mode. And so it would almost be unnatural for me to not assume or look for that next crisis. Even if I'm bullish, even if I'm long, I want to look at the other side. I want to know what's going on. Um, now, as far as scope for the world, you know, this is a common thing that comes up. I think everything's going to end up being okay eventually. I mean, I think the world's handled uh, you know, bigger issues than what we have right now. I think at the end of the day, we all have a similarly vested interest of keeping this whole fiat currency game going. So I think at the end of the day, we will get answers. We will get a fixes or solve, similar to what we had at TARP. Or, you know, we could dial back 50, 60 years Bretton Woods, which ended up being a bad idea, but everybody's in the same boat here, I guess is what I'm saying. So, uh, you won't see me selling everything that's not nailed down anytime soon. Very good question, though. Uh, from John Nicoli, a uh, newbie here. Good video series on Forex fundamentals. Uh, depends on what you're looking for. Um... You know, if you're looking for fundamental analysis, that's going to be a little bit more difficult. Depends on how deep you want to go down that rabbit hole. Um, if you're looking for like a you know a base of FX education, this is the course that I created a few years ago. I'm a really big fan of it. <laughs> um, it doesn't cost any money. FXCM gives it to. I don't know the exact portion of clients they give it to, but they do give it out for free to. I believe it's all clients that open with two thousand or more. Uh, although those amounts might have changed. Um, but this is the one that I'm partial to because it's all simple and condensed. I think I think the most important thing to know is that the future is uncertain, which could be difficult to kind of grasp, especially when you're when you're when you're kind of like learning things, right? Because yeah, sure, the future is uncertain. That's Captain Obvious statement. Nobody can predict what's going to happen tomorrow. But I want to be a profitable trader, so I must need to learn, right? Not even that. Really, I think that most anybody that is going to get to where they want to be in trading figures out they're going to do it with probabilities as opposed to outguessing the market. And that's when things like risk management come in as important. So I think as far as establishing a base for a trader, and not just in FX, in any market, I think first and foremost the trader has to learn risk management, trade management. And, and, and the fact that at the end of the day, your guesses, your predictions, at best, might be like two to four percent more probabilistic than the random guy on the street. Trading is not about outguessing people. It's about knowing what to do when you're right, knowing what to do when you're wrong. That, my friend, is the challenge. Um, from Pete, congrats on the one year of market talk. Well done, LDHF, my friend. I would not have been able to do it without you. Um, you know, having having. The, the base of support that I have from you ladies and gentlemen is just so incredibly huge. Um, that's why I bring it so hard every single day. I do not chill out because I don't want you guys to either. Uh, 
Uh, I got a few here. Hey, James, what's your look on DAX 30, Aussie, and EK 225, JPY? Um, I'm going to fly through here because we're, we're kind of out of time. Um, German 30, I was bearish on this. It's it, it's giving me nothing but bullish connotations right now, so there's nothing to press uh, at the current moment. Uh, we broke out of that longer-term channel, broke above this FIB level, broke above that prior batch of highs. This thing is just put in a... You know, I kind of have a inside name that I could could call this. I just don't want to do it on a public webinar. But uh, this thing's went ballistic. Let's just say that. Um, I don't want to chase it at all, but this is also too strong for me to want to fade it right now. So uh, I've got nothing to work with. Aussie is kind of the same thing. Um, it's going the opposite direction what I'm looking for, so I just I have nothing to work with on it. And given that we just popped up to a new short-term high, it makes me a little bit more skeptical of... Uh, I mean, they just cut rates. They cut rates, and this thing, you know, Rallies, it's, you know, it's, it's bizarre, and you know they got you know maybe less dovish on their outlook or whatever. But <laughs> the Australian economy isn't going to be doing that much better. Um, I mean, there's there's a there's a pretty monstrous real estate bubble in there right now, and unless they directly counter China, good luck. Um, and then the last one, Nikkei 225. So this one I was all over uh, up until a couple weeks ago. I was all over the short side of this up until a couple of weeks ago. Um, now, I think at this point, this, and this, I guess, is a kind of bigger picture thing I'm looking at. I think the yen, and I think the Nikkei is about to put in a pretty aggressive reversal because I think the BOJ is going to put up a big program in September. Just my guess. Just my guess. If they don't do it in September, I think they might come to the table in December. But this is one that I'm, I'm you know, still kind of cautiously watching so that I can line this up to the long side. Now, we bro broke above that prior swing high right here, just like last week. We shimmied lower after the BOJ underwhelmed, after the uh, Japanese budget uh, was released. And, and so right now, we're still seeing that bearish price action. What I want to see is I want to see this, this most recent top, just a little bit under 17. I want to see that get popped. Once that's taken out, it's time to put on the bullish hat, try to buy that higher low. It's not there yet. Yen, I'm a little bit quicker. Uh, we're going to be a little bit faster, I think, on this re-entry because we already have set these higher lows. Now, at this point, I just need to watch this thing to make sure that this, this low right here at about 103 quarters stays respected. As long as that stays respected, then I have my top side entry. I'm you know, trying to read this thing in the early portion of price action. Uh, Pete, any other yen cross on your hit list? Yeah. <laughs> if it's got yen, it's it's for me. Um, Aussie yen, a little dirty right now because of what I was speaking of a little earlier. Like I don't understand what's going on here, so I'm not not gonna I'm not gonna stand on the tracks and the trains coming through. Um, dollar yen, euro yen, pound yen, all three of those. I'm 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 getting closer to reversal mode. Even in the sterling. Even in the sterling uh, German Fuentes, dollar yen macro view. So it was about a year ago that I called the yen the safe haven vehicle of choice. I got a funny story about that. Now, like most millennials, I am real bad at email. Real bad at email. If you ever send me an email and I haven't responded, I really apologize. And I'm almost willing to promise you that it was not my effort. It was just I probably didn't see it. But I wrote this. It's about a year ago. This is just a couple months after I started writing uh, Market Talk for Daily Effects. And to give you the background, I'd done live webinars, live trading webinars for years. I think it was about four or five years before I started writing macro stuff for Daily Effects. It was just about a year ago today. And this was one of the big topics that I was hitting on at first. And I got an email from a guy, a real nasty email. The yen is not a safe haven. The U.S. dollar is a safe haven. The yen can't be a safe haven because they don't have a military. And that's incorrect. The yen, Japan rather, um, theoretically does have a military. They do have a U.S. military. It's called the Treaty of Mutual Cooperation. It's basically an agreement that was uh, struck post-World War II that the U.S. told Japan, hey, as long as you guys don't provocate, we have your back. Nobody will mess with you because the U.S. Army is protecting you. So theoretically, Japan does have, have defense forces internally, and then they have the United States. So it's implicit, but it's there. Um, but the logic behind it was uh, just one of game theory on central banks, which is fairly simple. If we go to dollar yen in September, 
this thing was still setting pretty rich. So there's China's Black Monday. Notice how the yen strengthened mightily on China's Black Monday. Then we pop up. I wrote that right around here. And the logic of, of, of the play was that the pressure is on in China, and nobody can stop that. There's only one thing the PBOC can do to even try to slow that, and that's to weaken the yuan. If they weaken the yuan, now that spurns capital flight. So the PBOC has a real difficult situation there. Either weaken the yuan and spurn more capital flight, or don't, and watch more debt go bad. Not a good decision set. When in doubt, always assume that they're going to pick the side of the least resistance. And they did, which was uh, yuan weakness. And so as the yuan weakened, again, that drove capitals uh, around the world, right? Into yen, into dollars, into euros even. And so the PBOC had kind of shown their hand. They were going to try to weaken their way out of it. And that capital only has so many places to go. And at the time, the Bank of Japan was already pretty stretched. It's not like the Bank of Japan could have just came out and said, oh, you know what? More QE because we want the dollar yen to get up to 150. Well, now what do you think U.S. trade partners are going to think? Hey, thanks, but now you're hitting me. So the Bank of Japan didn't really have the flexibility or the latitude to go with a yen weakness strategy whilst at 120 or above. And so they were just kind of ripe for the picking. And sure enough, as that yuan has continued to weaken in cycles against the U.S. dollar, it's driven more strength into the Japanese yen to the point, and this, this was my tell in January, when the Bank of Japan went to negative rates with no warning, with, 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 with no clue, no heads up, that shows you an act of desperation. If a bank is going to take that much risk on an experimental policy that is now becoming more and more proven is a horrible idea because it it, 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 it it inspires the opposite of what you want. It's supposed to inspire capital flight, right? Because, oh, we're going to charge you money if you hold it here. But it actually gets people to hoard it because it puts deflationary fears front and center. So that theme lasted for a while. Now I think we have somewhat of a flip of that theme because after we pierced 100 and dollar yen, now the BOJ and the finance ministry, they're on guard, and they don't have the same risk of condemnation for the rest of the G7 for embarking on a currency-led weakness strategy as they had you know, going back into 2013. So I think now at this point, geopolitically speaking, Japan has a little bit of room to run and triggering a monstrous program, and I don't think that they're just going to quit. I think that the same decision set that they faced in Q3, Q4 of 2012 persist today, which is your options are either do nothing or launch a bazooka. And we know what doing nothing is going to bring. So why not try the one avenue that might bring up some promise? Even if it's like a 2% chance, right? All right, guys, for another time, i got to kind of try to run through here. Uh, from Aussie Samson, can you trade Belizean money? You can. Um, with these uh, smaller currencies, though, it is going to be a lot more challenging because there's not going to be many banks that are going to offer quotes to retail traders. So the spread is going to be huge. I mean, if a bank will even quote it at all. Um, I actually have some Belizean currency in my wallet. I think it's Belizean dollars. It was there a few months ago. But uh, I haven't put that in the collection yet. Uh, Thomas Windsor, when's your next finger trap webinar? Don't have any on the schedule for any time soon. Um, I love doing those webinars, but it's uh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> and and I'm not, I don't mean to note that from a laziness perspective, but um, like I got to do a lot of disclaimers. And then, you know, there's, a, I guess, an NFA rule that says if it's something where the average person would be induced to take the same trades as you, you have to, like, disclaim it all over the place. And... You know, doing live scalping is just a little bit too close to comfort. Um, you know, as I'd basically just be doing disclaimers the whole time. But uh, yeah, there's plenty of videos out there on YouTube. Um, I don't believe any of which are furnished by myself. But I guess you could say taking a temporary pause. Um, you know, regulations are kind of kind of tight on that stuff. And while I love doing it, 
basically our compliance department has asked me to only do that on demo accounts. And uh, at this stage, I just I have a hard time getting excited about scalping a demo account. So don't have any on the dock at any time soon. But I promise you, the tool is sharp. <laughs> I use it every morning. Uh, you know, it's just it's kind of a kind of a hot wire when I start talking about stuff like that. Because then you get people on Twitter that want to banter back and forth about the euro yen going up or down, and that's just not my thing. All right, I got to take the last question of the day. All right, so this is a good capstone. This is uh, from Yas. Can you explain the concept of negative rates? Uh, <laughs> a little bit. Um, negative rates are desperation, in my opinion. Negative rates is the culmination of years of experimental monetary policy not turning bad. I remember back in the tech, or excuse me, the housing boom, uh, housing bust. I remember this, like it was yesterday. Hank Paulson, who was the Secretary of the Treasury at the time, former Goldman Sachs, um, a former Goldman Sachs executive, getting on television, crying, like literal tears dripping down his face, for having to do a public bailout, or pri uh, a public bailout of private companies. He's crying for having to trigger TARP. And at the time, it was so unheard of. It was so unknown. Nobody had ever seen that. A trillion dollar bailout of private companies with public tax dollars? That is just insanity. Or at the time it was. Right? Now, if you remember back, markets weren't even buying it. Let's go to the S&P. I remember because I got ripped up on this. I remember that like it's yesterday, too. I got ripped up on this. So I was sure this was going to be a big bounce. It just got faded right out. Hold on, where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? Hey, yeah, that's you. It's right here. I remember that. Right, we even had that gap up after the weekend. And it caught resistance. And then right back down. Right, and this is after TARP was triggered. And the QE1 gets triggered, and it still goes down. And the reason is because the world wasn't buying it yet until eventually normalcy was restored. Hey, have you seen? The Dow Jones is up eight of the last ten days. I already are. Go buy the dip. Buy the dip. Buy the dip. And then after we started to break through some of those prior highs, more and more, fo more folks started to buy into it. Hey, yeah, the stock market's not melting down. I could reinvest again. And then that led into the QE-driven market that we have now. Now, there was even a period right here. QE was coming to an end. Everybody's like, uh-oh, are we going to have the financial collapse coming back? Because the Fed's not going to be using QE anymore. They're not going to be pumping liquidity into the system. Stocks sell off. You want to know what happens? Guess what happened? QE2. I think it was announced like right here. I can't exactly remember. But then QE2 comes in. Right, whereas previously QE1 would have been like unthinkable, unheard of, unknown. I mean, it would have been thought so vociferously in a non-collapse environment. But now, no resistance. And then QE2, it just runs us up to new highs. And then once we get the slightest cough, once we're nearing the end of QE2, you want to guess what happens? QE3. Operation Twist. Let's get them both going. Why not? Long into the curve, short into the curve, we could add liquidity to all of that. And so now, every time we get a market misstep, the Fed has come in with, oh, you know what? More QE, or lower rates, looser for longer, more forward guidance. It's kind of like when you have a terminally ill patient, and they're on medicine. Well, eventually they build up a tolerance to that medicine, and they need more medicine to bring the same desired effect. And that's continued for like five years. So at this point, the patient just knows that they need medicine. They don't even care what medicine they're swallowing anymore. And so when the concept of negative rates were introduced from the European Central Bank, it was kind of like, well, their options are either do that or do nothing. And we know how nothing works. Not well. So that was the start of negative rates. 
then it was, I believe it was seven months later, maybe a little bit less. Then the Bank of Japan goes into negative rates because the ECB had tried it and they hadn't hit devastation and destruction yet, so it must be okay. Hey, that patient over there took the medicine and they're still alive. I'll take it too. The problem is that now we're finding out that the medicine may have been poisonous because it didn't go through FDA testing or trials or approval. It was just swallowed from a patient that knew they were sick. That's my opinion on negative rates. Um, in my opinion, negative rates are deflationary, purely deflationary. And, and the reason is because of what it is showing, that people will hoard cash. If I'm going to put money into a bank, and then I know that bank is going to charge me for holding it in the bank, I'm just going to say forget the bank and put it under my mattress. Right? Why not? Save myself some money. I'll actually make a return on a realized basis by not putting it in that negative rate checking account. I'll just put it in the mattress. What do you think started the Great Depression? Boom. Capital frees up. That was it. People afraid to keep their money in the banks. That's what negative rates can do. And it seems like these central bankers just walked into the snare trap without so much as a hint. So that's my opinion on negative rates. I don't think it's going to turn out well. But that being said, price action is boss. Price action is king. And it's all I could do as a trader is just follow the chart. But that, my friends, is what I have for today. I want to say thank you so much, everybody, for your time. If you do have any, any additional questions, don't hesitate to let us know. i uh, more than happy to help with whatever I might be able to. I am right here at jstanleyfx. Then, of course, if you want to join my distribution list to mark our one-year anniversary, That'd be cool, too. Let's put that link in the chat box. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.